Hello, everyone. Good morning. I know it's hard to get up. It's even harder for me because I have to get up earlier than you guys do. <laughs> so uh, thanks for the speaker of the organizer for inviting me to over. And, uh, and uh, you, you think you have got a very the conference has been going very well, right? I mean, nice talks and everything, you know. But you have to wait until you have heard my talk. Then you probably have a different perspective. And some people are smarter than you are, though, so they probably know that. So they, they, they just decide not to show up. So what I'm going to talk about, <laughs> uh, something I really don't have a whole clue, OK? So if you look at the the list of the co-authors of mine who made a contribution to this, to this work. Uh, so there are four of us. Eric did uh, most of the work. And he's in the audience, that's good. So if I, there's something I don't know, or most of the things I don't know, you can ask him, OK? And uh, Klaus and, uh, and uh, Wuta, they they did all the analysis, the number crunching, you know, all the computer things, and I basically, I, I'm here presenting it. So if I don't know what's going on, you understand. Yeah, all right, so uh, what this is about? Well, <clears throat> uh, the main idea is that we know the random knots occur, right? And, and uh, so, and we have a model to generate uh, the random polygons as a model for the random knots. But the random knots per se, I mean, the, one, the, the way we generate it, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, the equilateral random polygons, you know it has no confinement, which is not confined in, in any given volume, which is quite uh, the contrary in reality, right? In reality, what we have, those random things, usually they are confined in a cell or whatever, right? So they behave quite differently. And what we know is in the unconfined case that if the random knots you have uh, is highly knotted, then that actually affects its, uh, its geometry. For instance, uh, if you think of the radius of gyration, how big this thing can grow, in the highly knotted case, the thing tends to be much, much uh, smaller, right? It's more tighter, right? So, and so that's the kind of thing we're thinking. Well, so if we generate random polygons within uh, a confinement, like in, in our case, it's going to be within a sphere of a certain radius. Then the, we ask the same question. For those kind of things, whether the topology still plays a, a significant role or not, or, or the, the confinement itself is the major factor that uh, changes the geometry. So the geometry we're talking about, uh, we only look at just four things, the total curvature, uh, total torsion, and uh, the mean SEN, and uh, the rise, the mean rise. Uh, so, so let me start with a, a simple definition of what a, a random polygon uh, confined in a sphere is, how we define it. <laughs> so this is basically uh, the definition of a, a equilateral random polygon. So you have those uh, vertices between any two consecutive vertices, the distance is exactly one. <clears throat> and uh, without a confinement, when you take the first step, you work out the the direction you go is uniform. You, you, you have equal chance to go anywhere. Uh, but you are conditioned on that. Eventually, you have to return to where you start. And then you add a condition that whatever you generate has to be within a sphere of, of radius, given radius. Okay? And the sphere, in our algorithm, the center of the sphere and the starting point of our polygon is the same. Although we actually later changed it somewhat to, so that it can be different. But that complicates our algorithm a lot, which slows down quite a bit, which means that we were not able to collect a large sample of data to, to, for the analysis to be statistically meaningful. Okay, so that's what we've been using. <coughs> uh, 
So when you define this, there are more details in there, exactly how you're going to sample it. There are different ways to define how you're going to sample it, and actually the way you do it, it affects the distribution. So you may not get exactly the same distribution. So it's just an example here. Uh, they are on the right side, you see the confining sphere. In this case, the radius of the confining sphere is three. And within there, you see a random polygon, okay? The magnified on the, on the, on the left side, which has a step length of 20. So length of this is 20. It's just an example to show you, you know, an idea of what it looks like. Uh, so and this is a dis short description of uh, how we actually do it. So I don't want to go to the detail because it's quite technical, so how exactly you do it. But the, the point is that we can do it, and uh, we can do it uh, with a, a rather reasonable speed so that we can collect uh, uh, many, many samples. We can generate those things fairly quickly, as long as your lens is controlled. Uh, actually, I think we can go over that. We can go probably to 200, but uh, when you go to that lens, uh, it's the next step that we cannot, we are not able to do. When you analyze what kind of knots you get, then we, we, we get the, we get the hang up there. So we actually stop it there in our study. <clears throat> so the next thing is that uh, uh, the kind of uh, the geometric quantities that we we want to study, right? Uh, the first one is the total curvature. It's the, the angles that are uh, so defined. So at any given point, this is your xi. This is the next point, right? So if you take the orientation, that's a vector. And then from there, you have a next point. OK, that's your xi plus 2. And then if Think of these two vectors, right? So if you move that over here, then this two vectors has an angle, right? And that angle is the theta i. So, so you make that rotation. So that angle is between 0 and the pi. And you add all those angles up. That's the total curvature. That's how it is defined. And now for the, for the torsion, uh, on the other hand, for the torsion, if you take two steps, these are two things with a probability 1, you know these two things are not collinear, so it defines a plane. And this plane, these two guys defines a plane, then it has a, a normal vector, right? And then the next two steps, if you think of the next two, that also defines a plane, also has a normal vector. You, you measure the angle between the, those two normal vectors. That's how you define the angle. You use to define the total torsion. So that's the two things, that's how they're defined. Okay, so that angle is also between zero and pi. <clears throat> uh, then uh, the the ACN is you take a, a a random polygon, you make a projection. In the projection, you count how many crossover the crossing points you have. Uh, you make a note of that. But then you take another projection, you have a different crossing number there. And then you just take the integration of all of this over the sphere, over all the possible projections. So that's the ACN. And uh, rise, on the other hand, is when you take a projection, you look at it in the projection, uh, the thing is, is oriented, right? So you assign the positive one and negative one according to the, the sign convention. Uh, and then you add all those uh, plus and minus ones and that's the rise of that particular projection. And again, you have to take the integration of all those numbers over all possible projections. That's the spatial rise of that curve. So those are the four quantities that we are going to analyze. So the, what we're going to do is uh, you generate uh, those uh, random polygons, then you try to identify what kind of a knot it is. And this is... Uh, a description how we try to do that. So within the scope of our the, the random polygon that we generate, we are able to basically uh, identify uh, almost all of them. There are very relatively few of those we have trouble, uh, but even those you don't count it because they are statistically, they are not significant. So 
so that's how we, we handle the things. So uh, once you have those knots identified, of course, then you can actually put them into separate beams, right? So the way we do it is uh, at each, at a certain given length, and at a given uh, confinement radius, we would generate uh, a bunch of those random polygons. So you actually have to do a lot, because you have two parameters. You have the polygon length, you also have the confinement radius. So the, the <coughs> Our entire data set has more than 4.8 million uh, of them. Sounds a lot, but they are not for just one radius or one length. They are spread out, right? The length we studied is uh, from 10 to 90, and the confinement radius is from 1 to 4.5, and with a certain increment. And it's not uniform because there are certain cases where we want to collect more data to have a closer look. So to have, uh, so for certain of those, we actually have a larger data set. All right, so uh, the, the special ones are those. For those two cases, uh, we, we generate a, a lot more data for those. <coughs> okay, so that's our data structure. So that's how we got our, so, but for each data set, we have, we have, is it true that we have at least 10,000, Eric? You listen, okay? <laughs> for each data, for each given one, is it 10,000, the, 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 the data set? I think it's at least 10,000. Yeah, for those two, there are a lot more, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. All right, so uh, now I'm going to present lots and lots of pictures, which I cannot explain. And now, what I want you to do is when you think of this total curvature and total torsion, whatever, and they are, re I mean, we're going to look at them uh, by their knot types, you know, so for the specific, like, uh, you know, for the trefoil, for the four crossing ones, for the five crossing ones, how they're going to behave compared to each other. So whether that matches with your expectation or not. And I'm sure after a few of those, you soon you get tired. So by the time you get tired, say I give up, and you raise your hand, I will, I will shut up. Okay, then we'll we call it today. <laughs> so in the unconfined case, when you look at the total curvature uh, and the total torsion, the mean of those. Okay, so this is the, the total curvature, uh, the mean that's over all uh, uh, length n ones, right? So if you take all of this, then this. It's a theoretical result uh, due to uh, Grossbeck. So it grows like uh, n times pi over 2, So I mean, which is understandable. So in the free case, each, take, each step you take, the angle is between 0 and pi, and pi over 2 is right in the middle. So on the average, it's right in the middle, right? So it's pi over 2 for each step, right? And so that's why you have that uh, term. For the torsion, it's, uh, it's kind of yeah, similar, but the correcting term is a little bit different. So that's the, that's the unconfined case. So the question is, uh, in the confined case, uh, what do you expect? What do you think? Well, if it's confined in a sphere, so the total to uh, curvature. No, no, no. Inside. So before I show you the picture, okay, let's think what it looks like, okay. Well, you think the extreme case, if the confinement is the sphere is really, really big, then it's like the confinement is not there, right? Then, of course, this behavior should still be there. But on the other hand, if this confinement is really, really tight, imagine you are in a very tight space, you take a step, the next there's no space to go, you have to go right back. Then the extreme case would be like a pi, right? Every time you, you, you take, it will be close to pi, right? So the confinement would increase that the force you to turn over more, right? 
So you therefore you would expect to see a linear pattern like this, but with a larger coefficient, right? <coughs> All right. So uh, so here are some examples. This is a larger uh, confinement radius. So this is uh, uh, down here. See that's the length, right? And you can see the two curves. So the yellow is the torsion, and the blue is the total curvature. And see, it's quite linear. And so, so it's a little bit more than pi over two now. And uh, the behavior is quite similar to the unconfined case, right? Yeah, this guy is a little bit more than this, just like it's the unconfined case. So, yeah, no surprise here. And Tighter, okay, to R now equals two. And the difference seems to be a little bit bigger, huh? Yeah, so eventually, looks like over here, they are getting together. I have no idea. And then it becomes pi over two. Oh, uh, actually, it does not go linearly, actually, because it doesn't have to go to infinity. I mean, once it reaches half of the length, it's already like a confinement, right? So it flattens out. <clears throat> and r equals 1. And our, in our algorithm, the r, the smallest r is 1, because we started from the center. You have to take one step out, so we cannot generate anything with r less than one. So that's the that's our uh, so so it looks like that. So I mean, it does give you that feeling, right? So it it behaves linearly as you expect, and uh, it, it has a larger coefficient. So no surprise here. Which one is constant? Yeah. Twenty, isn't it? Yeah, but don't ask me why. That's that's yeah yeah yeah. How do you prove it? I don't know. It's the same. All right, okay, now, so that's basically this picture that shows you the effect of confinement. It's not the effect of not complexity, right? It's not about knotting yet. So the next ones would be about knotting, right? So, uh, oh, this just tells you how, how we actually propose this. Okay, so, yeah, you already see the picture, so. Uh, and those are how the fitting Parameters A and B are fitted. Okay, so <clears throat> now how do you measure that first? So you know those things grow linearly. If I'm going to draw the pictures, I mean because the n goes up, right? So those numbers are actually quite big. So uh, we decided to measure it in 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 this way. So in the per per age way. So you 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 look at the particular knot class, like you know, all the knots with uh, seven crossings, for, for example, here, right? And you look at the average, the mean uh, uh, total curvature of those guys, and then you look, this is the overall uh, mean curvature. You take the difference, and those are all of length n's, okay, within the same length. Then you divide by n, which gives you the idea of uh, if this is bigger, right, then this tells you how much increase you have Per age, right? That way, give you uh, pictures more scaled, and same thing for the torsion. So that's how we actually measure the, the effect. And let's look at the pictures. So this is uh, measuring. So for the fixed length of thirty, that's the one we actually did the most studies, right? So the the data down here for the small. Uh, confinement, it seems uh, kind of noisy here. Uh, and then for the larger ones, uh, is that what we expect? For the total curvature, you see, for the, so this one, they are all more than the, 
the overall, right? Because the, the difference is positive, right? So this is a, down here is below. Below means that here they are actually less than the average. They are, they are more than the average. So what does that mean? The lens is fixed. If for a fixed lens, uh, if the radius is one, it's a tight confinement. Then for that lens, those things actually tend to be what? Things in there tend to be uh, more complicated in general. So the overall thing is complicated. Therefore, those guys compared to the overall picture, they are actually relatively simpler. That's why their total curvature actually are less. But as the confinement radius increases, well, 30, length 30 within this confinement radius at the end is no longer that much confinement. It's, in fact, it's almost no confinement. Therefore, well, most of the things they are turned out to be much simpler knots. And those guys, in comparison, actually become more complicated. So now it takes over. So it implies that, well, not in is still making a difference, but in order for this to be actually above there, you, the knot actually needs to be more complicated. <clears throat> and still not quite the case, right? For the seven up to 10 crossings, you see down here, they are still below. Yeah, so the picture. That's right, yeah. The, the knots, I think the knots here actually are simpler than the average. For, for, for age 30, for 30 ages, actually you got a, quite a complicated ones down over, over here. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's one thing about the, the random polygons within confinement. When the confinement is tight, it's much easier to generate things that are much more complicated, which is not the case in the unconfined case. Uh, so this is uh, uh, in, in terms for the torsion part. The torsion goes the other direction, so it goes down instead of up. <clears throat> and, but here, I think they actually followed more or less the order of the, the nodes. This one? Yeah, the next one is actually on a smaller part of it because the, the radius did not go to 4.5. You see this one, only is stop, we stopped at 2.4 to give you a, a closer look at the tail. So this is a negative 0 0.02, but down here that's uh, See, this, this is actually up there. I think it's the, it's the data size. I think it's the it's noise, I think. Yeah. No, we did not. Uh, if we generate a, a whole lot more, we probably would be able to. Yeah, so, but man, that takes so much time. And <laughs> Eric's time, okay, not mine, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the torsion, and for the other, so for the higher crossings, it's a similar behavior. So, don't know whether this is what you expect. Uh, now, I, if I fix the radius at a three and I look at how it would change according to the lens, and this is how it is look. Uh, I mean, to me, I don't think there is that much difference actually because those knots for, in, in terms of total curvature, I think actually they behave very similarly actually. It means that the, the change in the knot complexity in this small knots is really not that large. 
So it's hard to see a really significant difference. That's how I take it. I mean, I think those, it means total coverage is not that sensitive to small changes like this. So you see they all behave similarly, <coughs> which is probably a good thing, right? It means our calculation is correct. It means they, sh <laughs> they should. <laughs> So this is just a larger portion. So you can see that uh, they go up and down. It's probably because the noise is, but on the other hand, it's also because they are close to each other. That's why you, it's easy to cross over. <coughs> All right. Uh, now this one is about the torsion, right? The other pictures are about it. So the torsion and the, the curvature and torsion, see, they always behave exactly the opposite. This one goes down and that one goes up. Okay, and, but again, I mean, it's, just, it's just still similar. They are quite close to each other. And higher crossings, same thing. Okay, look at the tail. It's more or less the same. <clears throat> However, uh, you know, the order of the knots, uh, you know, in this case, are uh, more or less preserved. <clears throat> Uh, one thing we noticed that uh, once we divided the knots up into the two classes, the alternating ones and non-alternating ones, we were looking at, of course, those guys, in terms of how to realize them lengthwise, there's a difference, right? So we were wondering whether you can see a, you know, a clear difference there. And so when we did that, actually it did show the difference. You see here, you can see clearly the alternating ones has higher total curvature than the non-alternating ones throughout. This is a very consistent. Okay. So the, it means that the alternating ones are more complicated, right? Harder to tie on the, on the average. And this is 10 crossing, it's a similar. So, <clears throat> and the torsion, then this tends the other way around, right? Torsion is going up and the, the non alternating one is on the top. And yeah, we don't, we don't quite understand why the complicated, more complicated knots actually tend to have uh, why is it this? See, the yellow one is on the bottom. And the, there, the yellow one is on the top. So the non-alternating ones has higher total torsion than the alternating ones, but not the curvature. So these two things actually, is it the artifact of that, that correct term that is causing all this? I, I have no idea. Would it cause such a big, but this is throughout the whole thing. I mean, it's not just, uh, it doesn't look like it's going to disappear. <clears throat> Okay, so that's about the total curvature, total torsion. So I, I really did not see any really big surprises. I mean, I think they are more or less within our expectations. All right, now uh, about the mean SEN. Uh, so again, in the unconfined case, this is a known result. So we know it behaves, it grows like this. The length of the polygon is N. So that's the growth rate. And uh, in the confined case, it's known that the growth rate would be n squared and uh, with a fitting function of, of that form. So that if this guy, if the confined radius is really large, like go to infinity, this term actually basically, uh, uh, no, this is not right. Something is not quite right here. Uh, this whole thing should go to zero when, when R is large. But, but I guess the fitting function is only for small, for, for, for small R. So uh, in our case, we use this fitting function with our data, and uh, it, it did fit very well. So we, we, we actually, throughout our data, if I just look at, if I don't look at the knot types, I just look at the overall sense we generated. And then uh, with a certain choice of the parameters, the, the fitting is very good. <clears throat> so uh, we, 
if you are thinking about a similar questions about the topological crossing number of those guys, then it's, it's topological now. It's not a geometry, right? It's not geometrical. And this guy is actually unknown because if we, I generate a random polygon without calculating, I just ask you, like, what is the probability? You know, what is the, the topological crossing number? What can you say about it? Then there's nothing you can say. Right now, it's an open question. So, so if we generate just uh, confined random polygons, we cannot even prove that the knotting probability will go to 1 as the lens go to infinity, unlike the unconfined case in which we could prove that. So, yeah, so that's one of the things that puzzles you, right? You think that this is so obvious that it's going to be knotted, right? But we just don't have the proper tool to prove it. <laughs> Oops, too far. Okay, so, uh, but in our case, that uh, in, using our data, we were able to actually fit it with, uh, with a format like this. So it's also uh, of n squared growth. So for, that's for the topological crossing number. <clears throat> And the way we measure the, the uh, <coughs> we measure using a similar thing by per age thing, right? So this is like similar to what we did for the total to, uh, curvature and torsion. So here is uh, an overview of the data tells us. So as the, uh, this is a comb combination of all the data we have. Uh, with all sorts of confining radius combined uh, with a weighted uh, mean. Uh, you can see there, it's very uniform. So the, it, this, uh, I mean, it's nice to have a nice picture like this. So they really go by the not complex as you expect, exactly in that order. This is uh, no surprise. So it kind of tells you SN is really good, right? In, in terms of determining where they are, right? And that's uh, for fixed uh, for fixed lens. Okay, so we, if you fix the lens, you change the confined radius. You look at the individual knots here, and that's how the mean SN changes. So that one uh, is the. Unknot, okay. It's the unknot uh, minus the the overall thing, okay. So it's again, it's measured uh, per age. Oh no, it's not per age. This this actually itself, actually. Yeah, this is not divided by n. This is just itself. All right. So that's uh, very for That's. A, Four crossings, but then those guys actually got mixed. It's uh, hard to tell. And by then, if you divide them using the crossing numbers in the groups, then you see a picture like this. And there, are the order, and that's five, and that's a six. Yeah. Pretty nice, right? Still uh, kept that order. And this is for fixed radius. So now we fix the radius at the three, and we change the lens and see how it goes with the lens. So each one of them, uh, the SN, the, the difference with the overall one, okay, it goes down. <coughs> so it means it means for smaller lens, the, the way you read it is for smaller lens, the knots actually are more complicated, right? Because the con with that confined, uh, no, the, the knots here are actually less complicated, actually, right? Because in, in that small confinement, you know, you would expect the knots to be more complicated. We just, sorry. Take it back. This is the lens change. Okay, this is the lens ten in same radius. So here they are simpler. So the uh, and this is measuring the difference with the 
the overall ones. Now the overall ones are simple. Therefore, those guys compared to the overall, they are more complicated. Therefore, they are higher. But by the time you get to this lens, well, they are crowded, right? Because the radius is still the same. You have a much larger, much longer poly polygons. So over here, the knots, you will get a more complicated knots on the average. So those guys, compared to those, would be simpler. So now they actually have less mean SN. So that's also reflected here. Uh, so. And those is by the class. Same idea, but divided by classes. Okay, so once you divide by class, of course, our, our data set is larger, right? Because you have more lots in each class. And the data seems to be smoother. And the, again, the order is uh, very well reserved. Uh, all right, so that's about ACN. And what about the rise? Uh, the rise, we do not have a theoretical formula in the unconfined case, so I don't have something to compare with. So instead, we just did the data fitting, so you can see that the squared rise, the mean squared rise. Okay, so uh, here we call it a fountain chain, it just means the overall thing. So, so if you look at the overall, regardless of what not type, then they behave like this. So, for fixed lens, right? So the lens is fixed. So as you increase your radius, the knots gets less and less complicated, right? Because the lens is fixed, you have less and less confinement. So, and that causes a, uh, oh, where's my pointer here, here, okay. Excuse me? Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's over all of them, yeah. yeah. So that gives you the overall behavior, in a sense. Uh, so, now if you fix the, the, confinement radius and you change the lens, then it, it, then it, it does go up like a, uh, in a square, in, in a square. So it, it behaves like quadratically. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is the rise uh, for the lens with the fixed radius. We just want to see if when you look at the absolute rise of those guys, this absolute rise. Uh, we did the rise. Actually, this is not rise square. I believe this is the rise. So that, that's marked wrong, I think. So you look at the, the number here, the order here. Well, maybe that's right. I don't know. The graph is right. OK. So. Uh, you know, in the, in the rice case, those guys actually kind of give you a sense of the ordering, right? How, how complicated they are. But you see, in this case, it's no longer like the ACN case because the sign actually, this has to do with the chirality now. Because they are sign, when you look at the projections, the signs would cancel each other. So in this case, you see the lowest one is the figure of eight naught. And that guy, you all know, it's a, it's a chiral. So you look at a projection, in many projections, the rise would cancel each other. So, so this is actually not that surprising, it's down there. Uh, what is a little more surprising is the, tri the, the trivial one is actually slightly higher than it. And then you got the purple one, which is uh, the six, the, the crossing six one. Very close to, with this, so this group is together. So, the four, zero, six, those guys are together. And this one is uh, the trefoil, and uh, this one is eight. The trefoil and eight, they are like in one class, and the rest, they are in a class. And this is actually quite interesting, because if you look at the, the rise the, from the ideal not rise, this is ideal not rise. If you look at the ideal picture, you look at the, the mean rise from this uh, ideal picture, and then if you look at the 
uh, rice from the raw sensor, not a table. You just take the rice because, like for six crossing, there are, there are, however, how many? Uh, so for for the five, right? So you have the rice is a five. Well, how did you get a five? How do you get it? the average here? Well, there are two knots in there. You just take the two, which is this is just a you know mathematics. You just add this two and divide it by two. So this is a very rudimental, right? So for the ten crossings, however, how many knots you have for each? One of those, you got those integers, you add it up, you divide it by the total number of nodes in there, and then that's how you get those numbers. But if you, if you look at these numbers, that's how those guys are uh, ordered in terms of their, their rise here. And they are actually matched with the ideal knot rise exactly for this same group. And so you can see this three in the first group, they are higher than the rest, right? Well, 10 in this case, uh, could it could go either way. So in our picture, 10 actually was with this upper group. And 3 and 8 in the next group, and the 6, 4, 0 are indeed in the, in the next group. So they actually are reflected in here, that order. Yeah, so even in the confined case, that's, that is to say that it, those overall things are indeed reflected somehow. <coughs> Yeah, so the order, because the, as things change, you can see sometimes they cross over and we, uh, you know, when they are close, again, you know there might be a data, just error, you know, so noise, right? But uh, you, for the, when they are far away, you're pretty sure that actually is telling you the trend. <coughs> oh, that is what I give to my faculty members whenever I have a department meeting. So. And that tells you how many people we have from different regions, okay? And if you see your name, you, you, you don't see your language in there, that means we need you. Because we, be, we want to be diversified. Yeah, apply, so we are hiring five people in the next year, so spread the word, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs>